Pedro is a data scientist based in Dublin for White Light Studios. Hi folks, so I'm going to be talking about LightVM today. We just saw an awesome lecture here about data-centric AI from Marizia, and she claimed, which I totally agree, that you should focus 80% on data, 20% on modeling. So why am I here talking about a model? I hope that becomes clear by the end of the presentation. But before, um, who here has heard of LightGBM? All right, uh, what about XGBoost? And have you ever actually used them in a problem for machine learning? All right, so it's a pretty technical audience. I have a rule of thumb where I ask about TensorFlow and XGBoost. If people know more TensorFlow, this means it's not very machine learning savvy, but this is not the case here. So let's start by dissing neural networks first. Um, I'm not here to show you memes. My objectives are actually twofold. First, I want to convince you to start using LightGBM or XGBoost for tabular problems if you're not using them already. And second, if you're using them, I want to give a taste of some inter interesting features, and I want to also explain how they work roughly. I'm not going to be talking about unstructured problems like uh, computer vision here. Just to be clear, tabular data means data that's structured in a table-like format, let's say in a database or in a data frame. That's what you face in most business out there. So before we get to the technical details, just a brief introduction. I'm from Brazil and I'm based in Dublin. I'm a staff data scientist at a mobile gaming company. I recently changed titles to data science manager, but since this is a technical audience, I want to give more credibility. Um, I have five years of experience with applied machine learning. I have worked with anti-fraud, credit risk, lifetime value, and currently market attribution. And I have applied machine learning to most of those problems. I have used mostly LightGBM and XGBoost on those problems, and they ha have served me quite well over time. Now, I also have a master's degree on deep learning, specifically on variational order encoders, and they have never not served me well over time. I have never actually used deep learning to solve a real problem that brings like, money to the business. I have only spent business money on GPUs and cloud costs. So we have a packed agenda today. It's quite technical. We can look at the slides later. I want to start with some example uh, that's going to motivate you to use LightGBM. Then I'm going to go over how gradient boosted trees work, what are some of the important parameters you can tune, how it handles missing values and categorical features, the loss function menu, including how you can create your own custom loss, some other cool features like early stopping and simple weights, and finally, model interpretability. So let's start with a Kaggle House price prediction problem. Anyone here was in the tutorial yesterday for data validation? Yeah, a few people. I was quite surprised, by the way, it was a great tutorial. I recommend checking out later. I was quite surprised because uh, the guy used the same data set as I did. Complete coincidence, but maybe you're not just very creative people here. And it's a data set which is quite small but interesting. It is interesting because we have 80 different features and they're of different types. We have categorical, numerical, and Boolean features. We just have 3,000 samples, so this is a very small data set. And we evaluate this on the RMSE, the root mean squared error of the log price. It's not really real life, but Kaggle is never real life anyway. And here we start with a simple LightGBM baseline. Don't really focus on the code here. You can look at the notebook later. My point is that in just 18 lines of code, you can read the data set, train a model, score, and have a prediction ready. But OK, how does it perform? It can just be a, a terrible model, right? It's actually average, so not great, not terrible. We get to the top 30% of the submissions. Here on the right, you have a histogram of the scores of this competition, and the hover is on the, our bin, our performance. So we are exactly at the mode of the, the distribution here. This means most people had a similar solution. And for real life, we know that this might be more than enough. Sometimes, most of the times, I would say, there is no point getting the extra performance points because who cares about log RMSE score in real life anyway? No, it's just an artificial metric. But of course, you can also see that on the right side, you have a lot of very bad submissions. So this is what you want to avoid, having a very terrible model, uh, not having a, the best model ever. We all know that to get a, a top score, you have to work heavily on feature engineering and tuning and also doing a lot of data pre-processing. So before you leave the talk because you're not so impressed with the results, I just want to give like a broad overview of how they perform overall. People who are used to Kaggle, they know that LightGBM and XGBoost work wonders for tabular data problems. So here is um, a chart that was publicized by Francois Cholet, the creator of Keras. This was a few years ago, so it must have changed already. 
And of course, Kara is the top model here. He just looked at the top five teams on Kaggle. And we can see here that Kara is the best, but if you sum, LightBM and XGBoost, they are more prevalent in Keras. And the reason is that actually this is just split into two types of competitions. For the unstructured problems like computer vision, Keras, PyTorch dominate. For the tablet data sets, XGBoost and LightGBM dominate. So my point here is that not only you can get a reasonable baseline with just a few lines of code, but you can also get to the top if you invest the time and effort. So as I mentioned, the data set is quite complex, even though it's small. Here I'm showing the view from Pandas Profiling. Um, if you have never used Pandas Profiling, I highly recommend as a way to do exploratory data analysis. It provides not just this summary view, but also a lot of deep dives. On the notebook, you can check out the actual like, uh, full HTML page. And here we just see the summary view. And we can already see some things which are interesting. The features are split into numeric and categorical, and we do have some missing data here. Missing data is always a big problem for most models out there. If you look at the alerts tab, I'm not going to show it here, but it's going to complain a, a lot of, about data problems. It's going to say some features are heavily skewed to the right. It's going to say some features have a lot of zeros. Some have missing data. Some are highly correlated. Some of the categories have ca high cardinality. So. Where are the standard scalers in my solution? What about the missing value imputation? What about the categorical encoding? What about the parameter tuning or the feature selection? I didn't do any of those stuff that you'd regularly do you know, for linear regression, SVM, neural network. And we just ignore all of that, even the missing values, and the solution just worked. So how does LightGBM handle all of that under the hood? Before we get to like, the cooler features, let's start with the basics. Let's see how gradient boosted trees works in general. And let's start with just one single regression tree here. Uh, just to be clear, it's always a regression tree, even if it's a classification problem. It's always regression. For classification, I explain a little bit later on the Q&A. And the idea is simple. Uh, We're going to grow the tree leaf-wise. And the difference from a regular decision tree find on second learn is that it's going to use a loss function based on the gradients uh, of your uh, error. So it's not just going to use some kind of impurity measure or like variance measure. It's actually going to use the gradient to make the best possible splits for each node. I have an exp explanation here. So the idea is that it's going to always choose the leaf with the max delta loss to grow, and this is based on the gradient. Uh, so the question is, for every node, which threshold best splits the sum of gradients between each child? And this is very computationally intensive. But LightGBM like and XGBoost, they provide a fast approximation using histograms of gradients. The idea is quite simple, actually. You just want to map uh, the samples to histograms. So instead of handling, let's say, 1 million examples, you just handle uh, 256 bins in a histogram. So now your problem to find the best split is much simpler and faster, and you'll lose very little performance. Now that we have a single regression tree, let's ensemble them. If you had a random forest, you just train them in parallel. With boosting, the idea is quite simple. You build them in an iterative fashion. So each new tree that's added to the ensemble is used to predict on the mistakes of the previous trees. So they learn the residual. The residual. So every single iteration, you are getting lower and lower and lower residual because the trees are just learning the residual. Uh, but something important to keep in mind is that we have a learning rate here to prevent overfeeding. So each tree contribution is not just uh, on the residual directly, but it's the residual times the learning rate. This makes that no tree is going to dominate uh, your prediction in a way that you don't learn the noise of the residuals. This clearly indicates that the learning rate is a very important parameter to tune. And the final prediction of the ensemble is going to be, first, the initial prediction, which can be just the average of the target, plus the contribution of each tree times the learning rate. If you just sum, and sum them up, that's how you get a prediction from uh, gradient boosted trees ensemble. So what are the most important parameters you can tune to get a good or reasonable performance out of the light, light GBM? First, the most important ones, the number of estimators or the number of trees. I recommend you use a value maybe between 100 or 1,000, but I have used in the past even up to 5,000 trees. You've got to have a good justification for that, because that's just computationally expensive. Um, 
And the second most important one is the learning rate, where I suggest using lower values in the standard. And my suggestion here would be the following. Since those parameters are very intertwined, that is, the more trees that you have, the lower the learning rate should be to prevent overfitting, you should train them together. So what you can do is first set the learning rate to be small, and then find the optimal number of trees with early stopping. I'm going to cover early stop in a few slides. And the remaining parameters that we have, like max depth of each tree, or the maximum number of leaves of each tree, or the bagging fraction, the feature fraction, all of them are going to prevent overfitting on individual trees. So it's kind of hard to like, uh, know uh, beforehand what is the ideal value. If you want to optimize them, you can use you know, random search based optimization. But you know, in mo for most cases, you can just use the default values. And finally, you have the objective function. This is super important because this is problem dependent. This is going to guide you, uh, your model, because this is going to define directly the gradient of the loss that's going to be used to build, build each one and every single of the splits. So I'm going to talk more about them later. All right, let's go to the, start covering the cool features that uh, happen behind the scenes when I train that model. The first one is missing value imputation. So uh, whenever I interview data science candidates, I always ask this question, how they would handle missing values in their data set. And most of the answers are something like, for numerical features, we use the mean or median imputation, perhaps mode for count data, median is better for outliers. For categorical features, you can just use a unknown, unknown class. Some people suggest to build a model that's going to predict the missing values, which in my opinion is not a good, good idea in general but I almost never hear that some models handle them natively. And that's the case for LightGBM and XGBoost. The idea is quite simple here. We just learned the missing value splits on each node. So say that we have a node that splits on square meters feature, and we, by using that logic as explained before, we know that below 100 should go to the left, above 100 should go to the right. During training, what happens is that if there are missing values on this feature, it is simply going to learn a separate split which minimizes the loss, but now only for the missing value situations. This way, not only you can tackle missing values, you can also optimize for them. You know what to do best when you face them in real life. But sometimes that can lead to disaster. This is a real example uh, that happened to me. I was working for uh, FinTech. I was building a credit risk model. It had great metrics, was already in production. And a business analyst came to me and said, look, uh, your model gave me a perfect credit score, and I'm pretty sure that's wrong because I'm a terrible credit card payer. At first, I was like, oh, the guy must be joking. He works for a bank. But no, he did have a bad credit uh, rating score. And I dig, uh, dig a little bit deeper, and they realized that the model was indeed very wrong um, because a lar large set of important features were missing in production for a small set of users. That included this guy, of course. But those features were never, ever missing in training. So the model never really learned what to do with them. And it has a default behavior. And this default behavior would just lead to like low risk scores all the time, which is definitely not what you want in those cases. So the lesson here is quite simple. You should never accept missing values in production if there are none in training, no matter what method you use. So let's do the same for categorical encoding. When I interview about this question, so I'm giving away some industry secrets here, I get answers like, uh, you can use label encoding to turn the categories into numbers. Uh, this adds some arbitrary logic to the, um, to the scale, which is weird, but that works well for trees in general. Or you can use one-hot encoding, where categories become a set of binary features. And this is not really great for trees if you have a large cardinality, because then you have very sparse features. Uh, trees do not do well with them. Or you can even get fancy and say that you're going to use target encoding, where you use the average target value by category, which is powerful but risky. And you can use also frequency encoding, where you use the category frequency uh, to make a mapping of categories to numbers. Now, LightBM doesn't need all that. Remember, we had 40 categorical features on the data set. It didn't use any kind of encoding. The way that LightBM handles categorical features, it's very similar to numerical features. It's just going to map them to histograms. So it's going to use the same idea, where uh, each feature is going to be mapped to a histogram, and this built using the uh, loss gradient. And then we sort the histogram according to the objective, and we find the best split. 
So this is very reminiscent of targeted encoding because we are using the actual objective of the, your problem here to create the best splits. Uh, and this explains why it's so powerful and useful in practice. And there is some regularization involved to make sure that you don't overfit. But if you have a problem where it's mostly categorical data, I would highly recommend checking out CatBoost, which is like a distant cousin to LightBM XGBoost, but it's focused mostly on categorical features. It just doubled down on the idea of using target encoding for categories. Okay, let's go over the loss function menu. As I explained before, we have to define an objective. And that's super important because it's going to guide what your model is doing. And LightBM offers a lot of options. You should not stick to the standard stuff. Uh, if you have a regression problem, the standard is going to be the good old mean squared error, the L2 regularization. Uh, not regularization, the L2 objective. Uh, this is the default, and it's going to recover the mean value of the distribution. Or if you have outliers, perhaps you can use the mean absolute error, and this is going to recover the median value of the distribution. If you have a time series problem, you can use the mean absolute percentage error. If you have a problem where intervals matter more than point estimates, you can use, use the quantile loss. This is actually uh, super cool and underutilized because a lot of people in practice, they might use some kind of statistical modeling, like a normal distribution to get like a prediction intervals and where you calculate the variance. Here, you can just say, I want a 95% prediction interval, and LightGBM is going to provide you one. Finally, you have some more specialized distributions for some particular kind of problems, like Tweety, Gamma, and Poisson. So if you have a classification problem, it has different loss functions, of course, you have for binary and multi-class, and you even have an option for ranking. You just don't have an option for survival analysis, but XGBoost does offer that possibility. So I want to go over like a real-life example where a uh, different loss function makes a lot of sense. This is the lifetime value model uh, problem. Uh, on the chart here is um, an example from a Google paper. Uh, and we, for many problems of lifetime value, have this kind of a distribution. You have something which is bimodal and right skewed. So most users don't spend a cent, so they are all in that delta function at zero. And some users spend a lot of money. So they are here on this right skewed distribution. Note that the x-axis is on the log scale. So how do you handle that? My first approach was to use a two-stage model. One classifier that predicts paying user not, so the probability of a paying user, and a regressor that predicts conditional on paying what is the expected value. And then to get the final output, you just multiply, multiply the probability of paying user times the conditional value on being payer. And that worked, was all right. Then uh, I attempted a zero inflated log normal neural network, quite a mouthful. Uh, this comes directly from this paper here, so I just used the implementation. Even though the name is complicated, the idea is simple. You just model explicitly the statistical distribution that models this behavior of bimodal and skewness using a log normal, a zero inflated log normal. This also worked, but I had to do a lot of tune, you know? As always with neural networks, I had to like, uh, standardize all the numeric scales, I had to take log transform of them, I had to create embeddings for the categorical features, I had to discover you know, the best number of layers, the number of neurons per layer, the learning rate, and so on. And just perform similarly to the uh, two-stage model above. But the best solution was actually a light GPM with just the Tweety loss. And the Tweety loss just works wonders with this kind of bimodal problems. And just with one single model uh, that can run like one minute, I build all of this complexity. Now, you can also create your own custom loss if the loss menu uh, that you have uh, is not enough for you. I wouldn't recommend going down this path unless you really need that, because it starts to get a little bit hairy. Because you're going to have to provide the gradient and the Hessian of the loss function uh, explicitly. Now, this is definitely less fun than using, let's say, TensorFlow or PyTorch because there's no automatic differentiation for you. So you've got to do it by hand. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's very hard. But I have actually used that in the past. And I use exactly uh, this example here, which is uh, we have an asymmetry in the error function. We want to penalize more over predictions compared to under predictions. This was just a business constraint, and our models were just over, predict over predicting too much. So I used this asymmetric uh, custom loss that comes from this blog post, uh, which just those two functions here, so not that complex, actually, and it worked. 
Uh, so there are some times where this might make sense because you can use all the niceties, all the goodies from IGBM and XGBoost. Uh, as I mentioned, missing value imputation, the gradient uh, boosting trees, of course, the categorical encoding, plus you can guide the model to do whatever you want as long as you can provide the gradient the Hessian. So I mentioned that you could do early stopping to determine the op optimal number of iterations or the optimal number of trees. This idea here is quite simple. It's just like neural networks. You just have a validation set, and you're going to be adding more and more trees until there's no improvement on the validation set, and then you stop. I applied this to the Kaiga housing problem, and it netted me a very tiny score improvement, which probably is not very meaningful in real life, but anyway. If you have a lot more data, this can make sense because if you have a lot of data, having more trees can really get you to the next level. And, oh yeah, this is not really very specific to LightGBM or XGBoost. Pretty much every single machine learning model out there have this kind of uh, feature, which is sample weights or class weights. I'm just uh, putting this here because I find this to be heavily underutilized in practice. And instead of using oversampling or undersampling, if you have an imbalance problem, just use balanced class, class weights. That's much simpler, much faster. It's going to lead to similar results. You can also use sample weights if you have a problem where the samples are weighted differently. For example, let's say you're building a churn model, and you have users with high value and low value. You definitely want to prevent churn for users with high value. So just train your model and add some extra weight for those users with high value, and it's going to learn how to handle them better than the average user. Same for credit risk. You want to limit your losses to the people who very high limits. So if you have a very high limit, just add a higher weight here. Um, anyone here has heard or used SMOT? It's a method of like oversampling. Oh, just, just a few. Well, don't use SMOT. <laughs> uh, it's not just my opinion. Those guys, one is uh, Kaggle Grandmaster, the other is uh, the Scikit Learn Creator, uh, and we all three agree that SMOT it's not very useful in practice. I won't have time to go into details, why not? And we have other cool features that I haven't even talked about now. Um, first, you can add monotonicity constraints. You can force the relationship of a feature and the prediction to be monotonic. So whenever a feature increases in value, the predictions must also increase in value. This is quite niche, but might be useful to have a more interpretable model, or if you have business constraints that force, whenever a value increases, you expect the prediction to increase as well or to decrease. You can actually use a random forest boosting method. So if you need extra, let's say, robustness or resilience, you can just use a good old random forest. That is, you're just going to build the trees in parallel, not in the iterative fashion, but you gain all the advantages that I cover here besides the gradient boosting part. So we're going to be able to handle missing values, categories, and so on. You can also use distributed computation and GPU support. I've never tried that myself for LightBM, but I have used that for XGBoost, and that just worked wonders for large data sets. I just used XGBoost for Spark, and that was so much better than use the Spark machine learning library. And finally, for interpretability, I would suggest not to use the built-in feature. Don't use split count or gain. Use SHAP if possible. SHAP is an awesome library, which is quite efficient, and SHAP uh, provides interpretability on the sample level. So you can get the explanation of the model is doing for each particular sample. Here on the left, I have two examples, and SHAP is just saying why the model made one prediction in one particular way and the other on a different way. So one is below average, the other is above average, and you have different features contributing to this. And on the right, you have kind of the same view, but now applied to multiple samples. So this is the test set of, the, of that problem. So here we see what the model is doing on the test set. And we can find stuff that's maybe obvious, but nice to know. For example, the top feature, the most important one, which is the overall quality, uh, the higher the value of this feature, the uh, higher the prediction. Makes sense, right? Like, the higher the quality of the house, the higher the price. Uh, so this is intuitive, but just taking this look can help you uncover a lot of problems. For example, uh, the business analyst case where I found out about the missing value problem was discovered just using SHAP. I just applied SHAP to that subset of users which had weird uh, credit ratings, and the answer just stood out in one second. All features that shouldn't be missing were missing, 
and they were all pointing out towards low risk. So after I saw that, I realized those features were the problem. And I'm getting to the conclusion here, so I hope that I showed you and convinced you that uh, LightBM and Dexiboost, they provide not only a reasonable baseline, but they also can get you to the ne next level if you need or want. Most of your tabular modeling needs are already covered with the built-in features, so you don't have to worry about standard scaling, categorical encoding, BC value imputation. Just do a good old fit predict, and that's it. That's going to work most of the times. I showed an example where it didn't work, so you are always got to be mindful of what is happening behind the scenes. That's the point of my talk here. And you can also use libraries that are well integrated. For example, you can use scikit-learn not for the modeling part because it just sucks, uh, but you can use it for like train test split, for example. You can use pandas profiling for EDA. You can use SHAP for interpretability. By just using that uh, small amount of libraries, you can um, do most of what you need to do for tabular problems without having to worry too much about like, uh, choosing the best model or tuning a neural network. And by doing so, this leaves you time to focus on what really matters in applied machine learning, which first, building new features. Uh, this goes really in line with what uh, Marisa said about focusing on the data, not focusing on the model. You should use this to focus on features and the data uh, by, for example, gathering new data sources or doing feature engineering. You can focus on proper evaluation methodology because a random train test split is never really enough to capture, let's say, the, what the model is going to face in real life. So try to create evaluation methodology that really resembles what the model is going to face. For example, maybe do a time series approach because life is always like a temporal in nature. You can spend user time to translate the model results into the business bottom line so you can justify your high paychecks. You can use uh, this time to do the proper decision making with the model outputs, so do the last mile, no? Data science is not just about creating a Jupyter notebook or just showing some metrics. It's about getting your model to production and making decisions based on the model outputs. And that's always much, much harder than training the model initially. And finally, you can use it, uh, the time for model deployment infrastructure and monitoring. Uh, you can never leave a model unattended, let's say, no matter which model you choose, because, well, the data, your problem is always going to change over time, and making mistakes is so much more costly than what you gain by no 0.01 log RMSE score. And I leave you parting words of wisdom from a Kaggle Grandmaster. Uh, it takes a lot of study to learn all the necessary machine learning tools, uh, but it takes a lot of experience to learn which ones uh, to ignore. Thank you. Thank you. We've got ample time for questions now. Hi. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, do you have any experience with the boosting parameter and especially the difference between Dart and gradient boosting? Uh, to be honest, I've never tried the Dart boosting. I only tried the regular one and the random forest one. And uh, I never really uh, looked into it. Same here. I really want to find somebody that uses it. <laughs> So maybe it's not so useful. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? It seems like everything was very clear. Um, aren't SHAP values quite computationally expensive to calculate? Um, great question. Uh, what is really impressive about SHAP is that the author of SHAP went to the libraries of XGBoost and LightBM, and he implemented himself all the C++ code to make that efficient. So he did all the heavy uh, labor to make sure that SHAP was going to be efficient for LightBM and XGBoost. So it's going to be a lot more efficient than if you apply on a random model, uh, which I agree, it's going to be terribly inefficient. Uh, but even so, it's not, yeah, sometimes you just got to buy the bullet and do some kind of subsampling. Um, yeah, even with this efficiency that I mentioned, if you have a very large data set, it's going to be too slow. So my suggestion is just do uh, subsampling or just focus on the subgroups that you're worried about. Like I mentioned, you can just focus on the, for that example, on the high risk scores that made no sense. So by doing that, you're just going to uh, focus on what matters. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question about SHAP. I never use it, but um, how, do you know how 
behaves when you have high correlation between features. Um, so let's assume that the yeah. first five uh, are highly correlated between each other. I don't think Shep would have a problem with this. And Shep also offers uh, very particular plots that just show the relation of two features. So if you want to investigate this in particular, you can just uh, use the Shep view, which is not presented here. But it just shows the correlations of the features and how that relates to the output. Uh, so we can look into that in very specific terms with Shep. But, but for this chart here, as far as I understand, I could double check it. Um, there is no problem with having correlated features. They're just going to be, let's say, sp spread out. Because uh, this is more actually a prob uh, question for the boosting method itself. But since we are going to use uh, trees that are built with some uh, feature fraction, you never want to build a model where each tree learns all the, the features at the same time. Uh, each tree is not going to be completely dependent on one feature or the other. So if you take the aggregate view of all the trees, some are going to be using one of the feature, and another, other trees are going to be using the other feature if they are correlated. And what happens is that the contribution of those features is going to be kind of spread equally. If you have, like, let's say, 100% correlated features, the importance of them should be roughly the same. And that's what you should see here with Shep. Uh, those features should be, like, let's say, on the same level because they should be, have the same meaning here. So, but see, for instance, we imagine that one of these features is actually very important for us, and one is correlated to that through another unobserved feature. Uh, so it's a spurious correlation, and we give a lot of importance to a feature that actually doesn't really matter for us. Is it kind of a problem in that sense, maybe? Yeah, that's definitely a problem. So first, let's imagine the situation where the features are correlated and it's not spurious. Then that's not a problem whatsoever. So it's not like a linear model where, I don't know, having correlated features can really you know, uh, throw a wrench into the, like, the model building. Um, for trees, they don't really care about correlation between features. They just, they're just going to use them equally, roughly. But yeah, if the correlation is spurious, then it's a big problem because you're probably going to predict something wrong in the test time. That would happen for pretty much any kind of model family. Uh, so you got to just to take some other actions to prevent that from happening. For example, an idea that I really like is that you can have an extra model that predicts train and test set uh, belonging. So it's a model that instead of predicting the target, it's a binary classifier that predicts whether a sample comes from the training set or from the test set. What is the point? Is that if you have a spherical correlation, maybe this feature is going to be uh, only used in the training set, not in the test set. And that should raise a red flag and should look into that. Uh, but that's just one way. There are multiple ways to do it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Um, thanks for the talk. That was really insightful. Um, so you mentioned cat boost briefly earlier. Do you only recommend using that when the majority of the features you're modeling are categorical? Or to put it another way, is it is there a detriment to using cat boost compared to like GBM when you're only modeling maybe three or four categorical features? I don't have a lot of experience with cat boost. That's a good question. Uh, from my understanding of not just my experience, but of the market, I'll say, um, cat boost is mostly useful in that situation. So there is no point using a model which is perhaps less feature complete than like GBM uh, if you don't have a lot of categorical features. And to be very honest, my own experience with CatBoost was negative. I was trying to like, improve on a simple linear baseline and was only categorical features. And I thought CatBoost would be so much better than this linear model. It was like a hackathon kind of project. And in the end, it wasn't really. So performing the same as a linear model was the same the first time ever in my life where like, great and boosted trees couldn't outperform like, a baseline. Uh, so after like, this happened to me, uh, this is just uh, no simple size of one, I never went back to CatBoost again. I just stuck no, to like, GBM and XGBoost. Sorry? Um, good, like in the absolute sense. Um, oh, that's one million dollar question, no? It was an actual real business application making like, uh, millions of decisions per day. It was like a real time uh, bidding of uh, ad auctions. And we were making a profit, but you never know, know how much more you can make. So comparing to other players in the industry, yeah, we could definitely do better. But I'm not sure if the problem was the model itself was, or the, the data, because we are just biased by the data that we have, right? Yeah. Is there any situations where you do Sorry, we've got to know. Oh. 
Is this related to this? Okay. Any situations where you'd rather use XGB rather than LightGBM? Yeah, so when I started to use LightGBM, that was maybe four years ago, LightGBM had an edge. It had more features, for example, it had this nice categorical encoding method that XGBoost didn't have at the time, and was just faster. And in practice, performed equally or better. So it was just you know, a win-win situation. And uh, after I changed to LightGBM, I never really looked back. But for this lecture in particular, I looked back and actually realized that XGBoost had advanced a lot. So they are more like, let's say, uh, they have more parity in features. So they're kind of converging to the same direction. Even scikit-learn is converging to the same direction. Scikit-learn has now the histogram gradient boosted trees, which just kind of copies the same algorithm here that I explained. Uh, it's also much better than the regular random forest or gradient boosted trees scikit-learn. So everyone's converging to the same place, and LightGBM was there, like XGBoost was the first, uh, but then LightGBM provided a very solid implementation, and today I'll say that's still very solid, and I don't see any reason to use XGBoost, unless you have something very particular that XGBoost does better, for example, survival analysis loss function. Uh, I have used that in the past, that was very cool. Next boost, LightGBM doesn't have that. So that's one example. Um, did you use a model agnostic version of Sharp or is it a Sharp package particular for tree-based models? I use, yeah. And, and also, did you try Lime and how would you compare Lime and Sharp? I have used Lime many, many years ago. And my experience with Lime is that it works well for more uh, unstructured problems like text or images. Uh, I worked with Lime for document classification and made a lot of sense. Uh, but for tabular data problems, I was never really impressed with Lime. At least that was four or five years ago. So I'm not sure if they have improved. Um, with SHAP, I always use uh, the particular tree and symbol method they provide, not the model agnostic one, because that's just so much more efficient. Okay, time for one more question, if anyone. Scott? Thank you. Great Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.